Hello everyone, I hope you're doing well. Hey, I have a new friend back here. I painted him in pottery class. Isn't he handsome? Hey, hi, hello. My name is Lydia. Welcome to my channel. If you are interested in true crime like I am, I hope you stick around. And a special hello and thank you to my returning subscribers. You know I am so happy to have you here. Today's case was a viewer requested one. And if you are ever interested in hearing me cover a case, just leave it in the comments below. I read every single comment, of course, and I reply back to every single one. And when you send me case suggestions, I write them down in my notebook. So I've gathered quite a list, not that many, but a list of some that I'm interested in covering. And I'm always interested to hear what you may be interested in. So send it to me. I'll take a look. Thank you. The case that I'm bringing you today is from the town of Poughkeepsie, New York, and these crimes took place in the late 1990s. Poughkeepsie is a small but a busy town of around 30,000 people. It's located about 90 miles north of New York City. And well, Poughkeepsie has been known to have its issues. Let's just say that. I'll read this quote. There is a small but persistent drug trade centered in the downtown area that periodically erupts into violence. Sex workers can often be seen working the same area and shootings are not at all uncommon, end quote. In early 1997, the Poughkeepsie Police Department became increasingly concerned by a recent increase of missing persons reported to multiple law enforcement agencies in the region and started to notice the faint beginnings of a pattern, starting with our first victim. Wendy Myers was 30 years old with a petite build, hazel eyes, and brown hair. She was last seen at the Valley Rest Motel in Highland, New York. Since Wendy was the first person missing, and she was reportedly self-employed as a sex worker, her singular case, on its own, hardly rang the alarm bells of a shockingly bigger problem. The next person missing was 29-year-old Gina Barone, and she was reported missing by her mother. Gina was last seen on November 29, 1996. She too had a small build. She was a petite woman. Other identifiers, as reported by her mother, were her brown hair and the tattoo of an eagle on her back. Gina also had another tattoo that read POP, P-O-P, on her arm. Gina was last seen in Poughkeepsie on a street corner having an argument with an unidentified man. Gina and Wendy were both known to the Poughkeepsie Police Department as working the downtown streets of Poughkeepsie, where they worked as prostitutes. But when it became apparent that both women were missing, the police department took notice. It seemed implausible that two women working the same streets in the same area would suddenly go missing around the same time. It seemed like more than a coincidence. And they were right. The third woman to be reported missing in January 1997 was Kathleen Hurley. Kathleen was 47 years old and she was last seen walking along Main Street in the downtown area of Poughkeepsie. Kathleen, like the others, was white, had brown hair, and she had a small build, another small woman. On their own, as singular cases, it was not unusual that the Poughkeepsie Police Department would receive reports of missing persons. However, this was unusual. The circumstances and similarities between Gina, Wendy, and Kathleen's disappearances seemed to be related. Poughkeepsie Police Department investigators moved on this suspicion that something sinister was developing in their jurisdiction and their region of the state, and tapped into the considerable collection of confidential informants, drug dealers, convicted criminals, prostitutes, and other street dwellers to start gathering information as to what these sources might know. And as it turned out, they knew a lot. The other sex workers who worked in the same area as Gina, Wendy, and Kathleen did, they told investigators of a man, 
a local man who was rough with the prostitutes and had been known to be violent during sex. They said his name was Kendall Francois, and he was described as a, quote, hulking U.S. Army veteran who stood at six feet four inches and weighed about 250 pounds. Kendall Francois was a large man, and he lived in Poughkeepsie just minutes from the city's downtown area. And when investigators began to look more closely at Kendall Francois, they found that he had recently been the subject of a complaint, a complaint of assault from a sex worker, with a possible suspect for these three missing women now in the police department's site. Investigators set up video surveillance and used unmarked cars to watch Kendall Francois's home. Weeks of surveillance went by with no constructive leads to be had, even though considerable effort was put into this stakeout. Investigators then decided to place a wire on one of the sex workers, and although she did make contact several times with Kendall, nothing constructive came out of those recorded conversations, unfortunately. The police department investigation was somewhat stalled at this point. They couldn't learn, couldn't glean anything new. On March 7th, 1997, a new missing persons police report crossed over the desks of the police in Poughkeepsie. Catherine Marsh was last seen on November 11th, 1996. She was reported as being white with a small build, having brown hair and blue eyes. But since Catherine's missing persons report was actually filed four months after she was last seen, investigators really didn't have much to go on. They were definitely at a dead end. They had no viable leads, and they really had no way of connecting her with the other three missing women. In April of 1997, the Poughkeepsie Police Department contacted the FBI Behavioral Science Unit for help. They were in over their head. And the local investigators, the Poughkeepsie police, were told that the FBI was, quote, limited by the circumstances of the cases. In order to establish a profile of a possible suspect, they needed a crime scene. As they hit yet another dead end, and as the investigators were trying so hard to find fresh leads in this confounding investigation, another Poughkeepsie woman was reported as missing. This would be the fifth woman reported missing. Michelle Eason, 27 years old, was last seen in October 1997 in the same downtown area of Poughkeepsie. Michelle was described as African American, short at 5 foot 2 inches, with a slim build and brown hair. Then, just one month later on November 13th, Mary Giacchione, 29 years old, was reported missing after last being seen alive in February 1997 in Poughkeepsie. Mary was described as, yes, being petite with a small build, just like the other missing women. She was about five foot four inches and around 110 pounds. All of this, all of these missing persons cases were now much more than just a simple coincidence. And it was shocking as to their obvious similarities. These missing women lived either in or near Poughkeepsie. They all had the same physical build, Most of them were employed in sex work. Most did not have regular contact with their families. And all of them had disappeared without a trace. Investigators worked tirelessly to come up with new leads, but women in Poughkeepsie just kept coming up missing. On June 12, 1998, Sandra Jean French, a 51-year-old mother, disappeared. Sandra's three daughters reported that her abandoned car was found only three blocks from the home of Kendall Francois, the only suspect in these cases. And in August 1998, Katina Newmaster was also reported as being missing. And she had a very similar description to all the other ladies who were reported as missing in the Poughkeepsie area. With still no solid leads, the investigators were desperate. They tried thinking outside of the box, and they tried many different tactics to locate these missing women. Helicopter searches were made by air. The Hudson River was searched on a regular basis by both the state police and the other local departments along the shore. Police informants were pressed for any information on this case. Hundreds of people were interviewed. 
and their efforts were commendable, but with no crime scenes to process for hard evidence and no bodies left by the suspect, investigators were mystified and the investigation was just at a standstill. These women had disappeared, left without a trace, gone, in the wind. Their bodies weren't located. No one knew where they were. But all law enforcement personnel that were privy to the investigation as a whole had a sinking suspicion that they were dealing with just one suspect and that this person was responsible for the disappearance of these many women. In early January of 1998, the Poughkeepsie Police Department decided to interview Kendall Francois. They wanted to talk to him about the missing women in the area. So the investigators approached Kendall, who they said had a respectable and calm demeanor, and he readily agreed to being interviewed. The interview itself revealed nothing constructive for the investigators, but they were not convinced that Kendall was innocent. Investigators went with Kendall to his home, where he let the detective inside his room for a brief time. The detective reported back that the inside of the house was in horrendous condition. There was garbage virtually everywhere he could see. It smelled awful. But Kendall made no admissions and said nothing incriminating, and by law, he was free to go about his business. And then there was a possible lead. In late January of 1998, Kendall Francois was arrested for assaulting a sex worker in his bedroom after he, quote, punched her in the face, knocking her down onto the bed. He then got on top of her and began to choke her with his bare hands, end quote. More than likely out of fear for her own life, she agreed to have sex with Kendall. But after the assault, the victim did press charges and Kendall Francois was arrested. On May 5th, 1998, he pled guilty to third degree assault, a misdemeanor, and he spent a total of 15 days in jail. Wow. 15 days in jail for assault on a woman and likely attempted murder. As more and more women were reported as missing, the investigation into all of these cases that seemed to be linked grew to epic proportions to include the efforts of the Poughkeepsie Police Department, the town of Poughkeepsie, the town of Lilod, the New York State Police, and the FBI. And like the investigation was growing, Also growing was the concern of the families of all of these women who had gone missing. And one of those family members said in an ominous statement to the press, if they find one of the bodies, I think they'll find all of them. I'm sure of it. And finally, on Tuesday, September 2nd, 1998, the case broke wide open. The day before, on September 1st, 1998, The Poughkeepsie Police Department was handing out flyers related to the missing women case from an unmarked car. And as they stopped at a gas station, a person hurriedly ran up to the car and reported to the officers that a woman had just been assaulted nearby. At that very moment, the police officers saw, quote, a very large man in a familiar Toyota Camry, unquote, driving out of the same gas station and identified him as none other than Kendall Francois. The investigators quickly drove on to intercept the woman who was reportedly assaulted and she quickly confirmed the attack. The perpetrator was Kendall Francois. He had been caught red-handed. Investigators moved fast, and in that very same afternoon, on September 1st, 1998, they went to Kendall's home to bring him, willingly, into the police department for another interview with the Poughkeepsie police. Kendall agreed, and within the next few hours, eventually, he admitted to the police that he was involved in the disappearance of the missing women. Kendall was arrested, and he was charged with a single count of murder in the death of Katina Newmaster, and a search warrant was executed on September 2, 1998. With an impressive team consisting of the Poughkeepsie Police Department, the New York State Police, the District Attorney, EMS crews, crime scene processors, and an absolute army of police officers, they all arrived at Kendall Francois' home and they stepped into an absolute gruesome nightmare. During the first hour of the search, 
the police investigators located the first body. Because of this find, the search was paused to preserve the scene, and investigators began to collect any evidence they could find. Collecting hard evidence was the first priority. The house itself was in a shockingly putrid state, with garbage that was strewn everywhere, on the floors, on the furniture, in the sinks, in the closets. Clothes were piled on every inch of the floor space, and sheets were hung up on the windows to block out the light. Old food, newspapers, broken furniture, empty cans and bottles, unidentifiable junk and garbage of every kind was strewn everywhere. The stench was overpowering. It permeated every single room, every corner, and it seeped out onto the street like some sort of toxic cloud. It was horrible. So imagine those living conditions, and then consider this. Kendall's mother, father, and younger sister also lived there in the same house as Kendall Francois, and they continued to deny any knowledge of what Kendall was up to in that house, as they remained utterly oblivious to the extreme, horrible stench that just permeated everywhere and into everything in the house. And that stench, as a side note, was how Kendall Francois earned the nickname of Stinky when he was employed as a school monitor in the years 1996 and 1997 at a local middle school. Imagine the horror of those who thought Kendall's stench was just a result of poor hygiene. If they had only known the kind of horror house that he was living in and what he was doing inside of it. Horrible. And as the search progressed in this nightmare house, over a period of five days, eight bodies were found inside the house. They were all in various stages of decomposition and they were all removed from Kendall Francois' home and they were identified as the missing women from Poughkeepsie. On October 13, 1998, Kendall Francois was formally charged with eight counts of first-degree murder, eight counts of second-degree murder, and one count of attempted assault. And in August of 2000, Kendall Francois, through a plea agreement, was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole, which allowed him to escape the death penalty. And on September 11, 2014, Kendall Francois died in prison of an AIDS-related illness, thought to have been contracted through one of his victims. The following is a list of all the victims of serial killer Kendall Francois. May they rest in peace, and may their families and their friends find peace as well. And that ends today's story. I know it was a little bit of a short one this time. If you have case suggestions, just leave them in the comments below. I always read them and I always reply back. Thank you for your time and watching this video. I know that your time is valuable and I am so glad that you chose to spend at least some of it watching this video with me. I have some cat videos coming up right now. But until next time, everyone, please take care out there. Take care. I'll be thinking of you. Take care. Bye-bye.